Um, so post-operative radiation. The, the question really uh, starts with the pathology report, which gives us clues as to whether the patient's going to fail. If so, where? Is adjuvant therapy appropriate? And is it just local therapy that's needed, or is it, is it really a systemic issue? Um, obviously, the size extent of the cancer, the Gleason grade, whether it was organ confined, the margin status, status of seminal vesicles and lymph nodes. All of these are really important to, uh, to get, an, uh, get an appreciation of. So is it really a scenario like this, where more likely this is a distant failure after primary surgery, or is it more of a situation like this, where in fact there is a reasonable chance that there is a local component and perhaps local only comp component to this recurrence. Uh, it, this is some very interesting data. These are trust rebiopsies in men with a, ri with a rising PSA after prostatectomy, all with negative staging scans. 40 to 50 percent had a positive biopsy of their prostate bed. And of course, that underrepresents the reality because of a sampling error in that scenario. But when I saw this data, I was like, wow, there really is a good chance of locally persistent disease. In that same study of those with a biopsy-proven local recurrence, two-thirds had positive margins. That makes sense. But a third actually had negative margins at time of prostatectomy. And 20% were, in fact, organ-confined. Organ-confined, negative margins, yet rebiopsied in the prostate bed, and it was positive. If you look at um, uh, margin status uh, assessed uh, uh, molecularly. So the prosthetic fossa in this case was assessed by five biopsies in RT-PCR for prostate-specific membrane antigen. A quarter with organ-confined disease by H&E had positive molecular margins, That's, which again I thought was, was, was quite extraordinary. So at the molecular level, there is quite a bit of um, uh, 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 potential disease uh, left behind. So where do these recurrences occur? In general, they're going to happen at the anastomotic site, the bladder neck, posterior to the trigone. Th these are the areas that, that, that we see. If we look at uh, MRIs um, uh, in patients who ha had indeed a, a, a radiographic visible uh, local recurrence, that's where we find these recurrent tumors, bladder neck, retrovesical, um, and peri-anastomotic sites. So those have really informed us in radiation oncology and the fields that we use to design uh, and treat the prostate bed. Uh, these are sort of historic fields now uh, from the RTOG, showing that it's really the space. This is a, a retro-grade uh, 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 urethrogram, the peak of the, that, that urethrogram, the bladder, it's that space in that area. Um, and here's some old films from the 2D era of treat, treatment. Uh, that shows you the, the, basically the area that was, was treated. Um, we've moved on, as per yesterday's talk, 3D uh, conformal therapy is now uh, very commonly used, and in fact, in the States, I think IMRT, again, has taken over. Here is a disease setting that I think IMRT has little to offer. I think there's some benefit, but it's little compared to the intact prostate setting. However, it is being used commonly. So I showed you this in the last talk uh, when we were talking about can expert radiation oncologists agree on contouring of nodes? Well, here's the question of can they agree on the prostate bed? And this one is equally as shocking. Um, again, case, two cases. One expert radiation oncologist drew 23 cc's while another 10 times as much. Same story there. Total agreement in this case was only seven cc's. And again, if you merge the outer border of the entire area of the prostate bed, um, it was actually a very large volume. I have to say, when I contour these cases, they probably range from 80 to a maximum of 150 cc's in size. So this would be, uh, uh, you know, these sorts of volumes here are likely just too big. And so here again are those, uh, uh, each color representing a different radiation oncologist contouring the prostate bed. This shocking data led again to an RTOG consensus, uh, and we thank the RTOG for developing these sorts of atlases, especially for trainees. And it really told us that the, 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 the boundaries of the prostate bed should be the caudal vas deferens, uh, anteriorly the posterior edge of the pubic bone, 
posteriorly, the anterior rectal wall, and laterally to the uh, levator ani, including the levator ani, into the medial border of the obturator and turni muscles. And so this is sort of what the prostate bed looks like now. Um, you can see here surgical clips. This is the area of, of uh, seminal vesicles. This is the bladder neck. This is uh, down at periastomotic sites. And this is what it uh, looks like in, uh, in sagittal plane. So, um, and here's just another example. So I'm just going to very quickly go through these and just give you a feeling, because I think it's important for urologic surgeons to understand well, what we as radiation oncologists are treating. It has to make sense to you as well. So we're coming from superior to inferior here. There you can see remnant SVs being contoured, tailoring it up to include more of the bladder neck here. You can see that posteriorly, it's the anterior edge of the rectum. Laterally, it's uh, going to the medial border of the obturator and turni muscles, now going up to the posterior edge of the pubic symphysis bone, going down through the bladder neck in the region of the anastomosis here. So that's pretty much what we treat. And it always looks like either a thumbs up or a toilet seat, I guess. Um, and uh, so then there was an independent group um, in Canada that actually looked at trying to develop a consensus as well. Long story short, they included urologists, uroradiologists, and others in the design of these fields. And so, in fact, three urologists delineated the regions at risk. Contras were discussed at a tumor board. A clinical target volume was proposed by radiation oncologists and a, radi a radiologist. And then a final planning target volume was developed with everybody's input. And indeed, interestingly, again, inferiorly, um, the, it started at the top of the penile bulb, um, anteriorly the edge of the pubic symphysis, posterior edge of the pubic symphysis bone, laterally medial border of the obturator and turni muscles, posteriorly the rectum. It's great. I mean, these were two independent efforts coming up with the exact same uh, uh, planning or target volume uh, for postoperative radiation. So indeed, um, that is, uh, and there you go, the toilet seat, um, is, is what should be, should be contoured nowadays. So we could, however, agree on the dose. And so the dose is typically these days in the mid-60 mid gray range. So this is a, uh, a survey of um, 10 or 11 largely American one um, uh, institution from Australia, uh, survey of how do they treat postoperatively. So you can see a lot of places are using IMRT. The data supporting that is not that strong. A lot of places are using IGRT, image guidance. Remember all the other things I discussed, which are, include the EM transponders, those beacons, those GPS devices in the postoperative setting, uh, as well as daily comb beam and other means. You can see that mostly they would agree on dose, roughly the mid-60 gray range at this snapshot of a n number of uh, institutions. And that was in the adjuvant setting. That was adjuvant dose. What about the salvage setting with a detectable PSA? Typically, most institutions were adding a fraction or two of radiation in the salvage setting. What about regional lymph nodes in the adjuvant setting? In that case, some places were using it in high-risk scenarios. I have to say, in general, I would not treat the pelvic lymph node regions in the adjuvant setting with an undetectable PSA. Uh, what about hormonal therapy in the adjuvant setting? Again, you can see some using it if it was node-positive disease. That probably makes sense, uh, or some high-risk characteristics. Typically not if PSA is undetectable and, and sort of re regular risk. Um, what about in the salvage setting? There's a split. Some do, some don't. What about hormone therapy in the salvage setting? Here's an area, which we'll get to later on, that, that is still begging for published data to support this. Um, or good data to support this, but a lot of places are starting to use hormonal therapy along with radiation in the salvage setting. Um, and we'll skip over those. So if indeed a man is at risk for a local failure, his curative options are really to treat him with radiation earlier, early or late with adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy. And so here are the, the studies that inform this. Three large randomized trials informing the use of adjuvant radiation postoperatively. I would I'd characterize US practice as early salvage radiation, uh, despite those studies. And then, of course, it might just be at some point too late to entertain radiation. So a quick summary of the adjuvant trials. Three trials, 
American, European, German trials, all with surprisingly consistent results. Look at those hazard ratios, almost equal in all of them, suggesting very significant benefits in freedom uh, or in progression-free survival. Um, so all very consistent in that, in that regard. The American SWOG study indeed also showed a metastasis-free survival benefit, which was its primary endpoint, and in, in fact also an overall survival benefit with longer-term uh, follow-up. There was also freedom from ever needing hormone therapy, and indeed the survival benefit in general was a medium two-year survival benefit with the need to treat nine patients to prevent one death. That is extraordinarily strong data for the use of adjuvant radiation. But what, what did the ERC, ERTC trial tell us? This is a trial that was recently updated about a year ago in the Lancet. Long-term follow-up, lots of institutions. Again, a remarkably strong benefit in biochemical progression-free survival. All the studies are consistent in that regard. That is the primary endpoint also of this study. What about clinical progression-free survival? That used to be significant. It's an in initial reporting. Technically, now it wasn't, though the trend was perhaps there. Um, and what about, perhaps we would might, may argue, more meaningful endpoints? Distant METs, prostate cancer-specific mortality, overall survival, um, none of those were in fact significant in the ROTC update. So you have two discordant findings, the American SWOG study showing metastasis-free and overall survival benefit, the European study not showing those benefits, all of them, however, showing progression-free survival benefit. So why is that? Why are the conflicting results regarding the impact of adjuvant radiation on metastases and survival? Well, there are a few reasons if you look at these studies closely. Uh, there is an increased use of salvage therapy in the ERTC arm for those who were initially observed and subsequently failed. There was a higher rate of distant metastasis in the observation group uh, in the SWOG trial and therefore decreased overall survival. It was just a higher rate, I mean, pretty significantly in the observation uh, uh, arm uh, uh, in, in uh, in the SMOG trial. There was also a higher number of non-cancer-related deaths in the post-operative radiation group in the RTC arm. So those who got adjuvant radiation in the RTC tri trial just had a lot of unknown non-cancer deaths. It was, it was uh, um, uh, unexplained entirely. Um, so there are limitations to these trials. The adjuvant trials are not all truly adjuvant. About a third of the patients had actually a detectable PSA at time of enrollment, so the, these are really not truly adjuvant, adjuvant studies. In addition, very importantly, in the control arm, in the observation group, not all received salvage radiation or salvage therapy at all. And most who did get salvage therapy got it kind of too late, that sort of too late part of the curve that I showed earlier. In fact, in the SWOG study and in the ERTC study, almost 40% got it at time of clinically or radiographically detected local failure, um, which we would all argue is too, too late, with a median PSA of 1.7. We'll come back to that later, but that PSA is too high. So really these trials were adjuvant or early salvage versus later no salvage. Um, the question then comes out of these trials, are there subgroups of patients who we shouldn't treat? Some say those who are T3B disease, seminal vesicle invasion, they're going to do bad, they're more likely to have distant disease, we shouldn't treat them with adjuvant radiation, a local therapy. That indeed doesn't hold true in these studies. In fact, in the SWOG study, there was a specific paper written just for the SV positive patients, again showing benefit to adjuvant radiation over observation in that subgroup. One, the strongest predictor of benefit, however, of prolonged disease-free survival uh, would surely be positive margins. Um, and that, that's an important point to get across. If you're considering adjuvant therapy, positive margins is the right setting to do so. Um, and indeed, there was actually no effect in this analysis of the ERTC trial in the location of those positive margins, meaning apical wasn't worse than some other uh, location of the positive margin. Indeed, in the ERTC trial, those who did worse were those who had positive surgical margins and who were watched, observed. So um, that, that might be a subgroup to consider treatment. In the ERTC update, um, this is, uh, you know, in general, most clinical factors were um, trending towards uh, benefit, except age over 70. 
that was another important finding from the ERTC update. It seemed that adjuvant therapy had less benefit in men who were over the age of 70. So its, its take-home point was really consider adjuvant therapy in younger patients who have positive margins, and I think that's probably the right subgroup. Um, in general, uh, morbidity was acceptable after, um, after adjuvant therapy. Uh, in the SWOG trial, in fact, um, if you were observed, about a third required subsequent radiation, and there was a doubling in the need of subsequent hormone therapy. In the adjuvant radiation arm, yes, rectal complications went up, urethral stricture rate doubled, and incontinent, or incontinence rates were a little higher as well. However, interestingly, in a companion quality of life study, yes, if you got adjuvant radiation, you had acute, more acute GIGU side effects. There was, however, no difference in the rates of ED. Um, however, I would argue that probably surgery has evolved, and this would probably be different today. Um, but they also did a, a global quality of life analysis. And so, yes, global quality of life was initially worse if you got adjuvant radiation, because you had more GIGU effects. But it was similar by two years, and it was superior in the following three years. Now, why would that be? Why? Because there were more cures. There, were, uh, uh, there was less need for subsequent hormone therapy. All of these sorts of things affecting anxiety, depression, and all the other si toxicities and morbidity of hormone therapy explained why long-term quality of life was better in the adjuvant arm. So really this comes down, and I imagine this is also a very, you know, it is a very relevant question in the UK. Do you do adjuvant for all or salvage for some? And what is the optimal timing of postoperative radiation? If we look at salvage radiation series, we're not informed by level one evidence yet. Um, in fact, they're institutional experiences. This is a Hopkins study as well, showing that it didn't matter if you got hormones with your radiation, but it did matter that you got radiation uh, uh, in, 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 as opposed to not getting radiation in the salvage setting with survival benefit. Um, but in general, we're informed by institutional and retrospective series in the salvage setting. There's nomograms that have been developed that many of you uh, are well aware of that suggest high Gleason score, high PSA before initiating salvage therapy, negative surgical margins, rapid PSA doubling times, and seminal vesicle invasion are associated with worse outcomes or less likelihood of salvage radiation to work. It doesn't mean it doesn't work, it just is less likely to. So let's take a, the best possible scenario. You have a low PSA before starting salvage radiation. You had a low Gleason score to begin with. Your margins were positive, and your PSA doubling time is long. Your likelihood of um, uh, progression-free survival is 70%. That's really quite high. So you really need to think about salvage radiation in that setting. What about the worst case scenario? High grade, um, negative margins. It's working about 18% of the time. So that's not zero. It's not as good, obviously, but it's not zero. So you, one should still consider salvage radiation, even in the negative margins, high PSA, high Gleason score scenario. At least think about it. Um, some studies, the Trox study from Hopkins, suggested, again, radiation was important as opposed to no, no radiation as far as outcome. However, it seemed to be most useful. The, 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 the values were significant when you had a, uh, um, uh, a, a rapid PSA doubling time, which was sort of odd. So it was in those who had uh, rapid PSA doubling times. In other series, these are all retrospective, one has to admit. It didn't matter whether you had a rapid or a slow PSA doubling time. Benefit was seen in either scenario. So uh, again, probably even PSA kinetics don't fully inform whether or not one should use uh, salvage radiation. The one thing that we do know, and this is an important message for everybody, the lower the PSA, the better. And when you do initiate salvage radiation, that it, whoops, that's very clear in the data, and that's consistent. If you wait until your PSA goes above 1.5, it's much, much less likely to work. In fact, in this nomogram, there's the suggestion that there's, in fact, no, no threshold per se, that it's a continuous factor, as is suggested here, pre-radiotherapy PSA. So it seems to have a continuous effect. Indeed, starting radiation when, it's, when the value is 1.2, or at 0.2 as opposed to 1.2, had as much of an effect as whether or not there was lymph node metastases present or not. That just shows you the lower the PSA, the better. In fact, some studies suggest that there is a 2.6% loss 
of um, relapse-free survival per incremental 0.1 rise in the PSA. Um, I'm getting towards the end, but the, the, the next important question is, of course, as you're well aware of with radicals and other studies, is the role of hormone therapy in the salvage setting. Indeed, there is, in fact, a randomized trial that's been long completed. But as, we, as one thing we've learned today, you have to wait 15 years for results. And even then, you may still be waiting. So this was started in 1996 in the RTOG. Bill Shipley ran this phase three trial, lots of patients. And it was radiation plus or minus two years of bicalutamide, which made sense at that time. Doesn't make sense to us now. We'd be using LHRH agonist. But long-term follow-up, again, seemingly a benefit. This is not published, by the way. It has not met its primary endpoint. This is coming from a presentation. Seemingly a benefit in freedom from progression. Seemingly a benefit in metastasis-free survival by the addition of hormone therapy to salvage radiation. And indeed, you all know this trial better than I do. The radicals trial is really looking at the timing issue of adjuvant versus early salvage, and also the use of hormone therapy and its duration in the post-operative setting. I think this will be very much a practice-changing trial. Um, within the URTC, in the high-risk scenario after prostatectomy, there's also a trial going on looking at adjuvant radiation versus radiation plus six months of LHRH agonists. Um, this is important to, to note that imaging is getting, import, uh, is getting increasingly important. There are novel imaging modalities, primarily MRI and PET-based. Here's an example of lymphotropic nanoparticle lymph node mapping, where um, it has lymph node avidity to these super param uh, paramagnetic uh, iron oxide nanoparticles that show you disturbed uh, uh, nodal structure. And in fact, in this series of 26 post-operative PSA failures referred for salvage radiation who were node negative and PSA was under four, almost a quarter of them had subclinical incidental lymph node positivity by this imaging modality. So this, of course, plays a role in informing radiation fields or whether or not to use radiation at all, depending on where this positivity is. So I think you're going to see more and more acceptance. I mean, we know uh, uh, Colleen Pett and other, other sorts of imaging are have a, finding a role here. And this is to answer your question that I was asked earlier um, by, by the gentleman there in the third row. Do you use, what, what about pathologically node positive patients? Post-op, node positive, do you just give them hormone therapy alone or should you add in radiation? This is probably the best study to inform that question. It's a case match analysis between a series in Italy and the Mayo Clinic uh, that shows, in fact, a survival, significant survival advantage to adding in radiation therapy and hormone therapy in the pathologically node positive setting. And here are the overall survival benefit um, at 10 years of roughly 20%. So the, the answer, I think, although there's no level one evidence, this is the best data there, is these are tough patients, um, very high risk, and there is perhaps a chance of improving outcome by referring them for consideration of radiation and hormones. Um, what about radiation field? Should we treat the whole pelvis or just the prostate bed? No great data to inform this question either. Um, this, is two, two, this is case matched, two institutions in the US. One institution always treated the whole pelvis, one just treated the prostate bed. It appears that the whole pelvis group is doing better. Um, so again, uh, there's the reason to consider that in a salvage setting. There's one trial that's addressing this issue in the RTOG, rising PSA after prostatectomy. Three arms to this randomized trial, either salvage radiation to the post prostate bed alone, salvage radiation plus short course hormonal therapy, salvage radiation to prostate bed and nodal irradiation and hormone therapy, progressively more aggressive in each of those arms, but you can see sort of where this field is going. So in conclusion, uh, a rising PSA with a local component is relatively common for pathologic T3 tumors and positive margins. Adjuvant radiation reduces the risk of PSA recurrence. Three large randomized trials are consistent with that and the need for subsequent hormonal therapy. It may decrease clinical failure metastasis and improve survival. May, underline may, the URTC and the SWOG trials are a little discordant. The benefit seems to be most concentrated among the younger patients with positive margins. Those are the ones that consider adjuvant therapy in. Though it may be seen in positive seminal vesicles, rapid PSA doubling time, and even node positive diseases we just saw. The morbidity of this treatment appears acceptable, and it is certainly lower than current systemic alternatives. 
lifelong androgen deprivation, or other. The optimal timing of radiation, early salvage versus adjuvant, the field size, do you conclude the nodes, the role of hormonal therapy in, this, in the salvage setting all await these important ongoing randomized controlled trials. But in the meantime, if you are using salvage radiation, the earlier, the better. The lower the PSA, the better. All data is consistent on that point. So when surgery has probably failed to cure the patient, the best prospective data still support the use of postoperative radiation. It is that second chance at cure. And the onus is really much on the uro-oncology team to work as a team, to discuss postoperative radiation with the therapy, uh, with the patient, address its optimal timing when it is used, and provide justification when it's not. And I think that this is a nice collaborative uh, review here on that topic with a conclusion saying, given the absence of data from randomized trials demonstra demonstrating superiority of one approach over the other, meaning early, adjuvant, or, sorry, early salvage versus adjuvant, in terms of quantity and quality of life, we advocate multidisciplinary input and shared and informed decision making among patients, urologists, and radiation oncologists based on the relative advantages and disadvantages of each approach. And I think that fits nicely with the themes from, that were raised in yesterday's session as well. So thank you for your attention. And uh, thank you for having me here. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs>